welcome to Guaglobe. Thank you for being here. The goal of this video on Avalon the Riven Veil by Shadowborn Games is threefold. One, I want to show you the faction powers, run through how they work thematically, and talk a little bit about how the experience differs from playing the standard, uh, you know, everyone is self-balanced version of the game versus integrating the asymmetric abilities when you play. Two, I want to highlight the beautiful miniatures here because so far most of the stuff you've been seeing have all been digital renders and I think there's something nice about seeing a physical prototype spinning in front of you. And then three, I don't know if I already said three, I should have said two before, I'm going to continue either way, don't worry about it. Here's the other thing that I want to find out. I am working right now on getting a gameplay video, at least one full gameplay video done before the end of the Kickstarter campaign. By the way, links in the top of the video description if you want to swing over and check out this project or back it yourselves. We are doing sponsored content with the team and the gameplay video that I'm producing is done not as a sponsored video. It's done because I want to show off and showcase more of this experiential game. This game that multiple people so far have said is one of the best new area control style board games coming to the market with fives out of fives and tens out of tens flying all around. But so far we only have one gameplay in the conversation, a live stream gameplay from Dice Tower with three players and standard faction abilities. I'll talk about this a little bit more as the video continues, but my goal is to hear from you the audience that are following along with Avalon, what do you want to see? What player count do you want to see? What type of factions do you want to see go head to head? How many total rounds? Should we do two seasons or three seasons? Creatures that are integrated? Do we want to use catch-up mechanics or let it be a winner-take-all style experience? Again, we'll get there, but that's the third reason I'm doing this video. I'm going to try to make it quick. I'm going to try to break this down as fast as I can. The team over at Shadowborn actually have already produced an excellent video walking through some of the more nuanced strategy and breaking down these factions when it comes to the actual abilities they have. So I want to talk a little bit more around how they operate on the board, show off the models, and talk about the thematic tropes or the uh, over, over, overture, the experience that you're getting when you play. So this is Avalon. This is a area control style game that plays through a series of seasons where you're going to be taking card based actions from a hand of various different card powers. Every single card has its own unique ability and this is not the video to get into the depth of that. But there is a combination of hand management, area control, and also player powers and abilities. In the base version of the game, the standard version, you get straight out of the box the first version you're going to play, you're going to be utilizing the side of the board that doesn't allow you to supercharge your hero and only gives you a set of, well, universal actions that everyone can utilize. A move, deploy, gain a card, and claim victory. That's nice, that's great, that's lovely, but it's not where this game can go. If you fall in love with Avalon, like I think many people will, you're going to be asking yourself the question, well, what else is there to do? And this is where the game gets wild. Not only can you change the way the board layout happens, you can remove some of the catch-up mechanics that exist, you can extend the game or shorten the game to make it a little bit tighter or wider, you can play two-player, three-player, four-player, and who knows what else they're going to have planned down the road, but you can also change your boards. You can make your boards thematically asymmetrical, meaning that your players have their own unique mission, kind of a la route, right? Their own journey that they're going on, and if you play them to the best of your ability or the best of their ability, you might just be able to secure the victory because of it. We're starting here with Knights of the Round with Guinevere, who is looking for her uh, lost love, the hero who still believes that uh, King Arthur is out there in the district. You can see the beautiful models that we have here. She has her captains, her leaders there, her model itself integrated with this awesome little colored, uh, awesome little colored plastic. I'm a little split on the colored plastic. I'm going to be honest about that. All the heroes have it integrated here. And the reason I'm split on it is because it looks amazing, which means I have no desire to actually go through and paint my version of this game. I don't normally paint my versions of these games, and considering that this is a game that relies on color pretty primarily, 
Probably not a best idea to paint them anyway, but still, I, 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 think, I think the integration of multiple different types of construction going into the models that we're seeing come to the market now is really, really nice. I mean, this is the same game, the same company that did the modular, all the pieces of your heroes fit together in Oathsworn originally. So they're doing a lot of really cool things and they're always trying to push the boundaries of what they're creating. So we have Knights of the Round. Again, let me just give this a beautiful little spin here. Let's see here. Let's see if I can uh, grab this camera here, pull focus up to where you can see it and just show you how nice that model is. All right, how do they play? So if you're playing the asymmetric side of this character, Guinevere, you're going to be exploring and looking for your lost love. You're gonna be looking for King Arthur. This is the search for the once and future king. Is there any flavor text here? I don't see any flavor text specifically, so I'll have to ad lib it a little bit myself. Her core ability, her core mission in this game is right here, the faction objective. You're going to accomplish this whenever you complete a prophecy or gain a grail or Excalibur, or gain the grail or Excalibur. So as you search and successfully accomplish missions in the game, you, you know, fulfill whatever objectives are there, you hear rumors that there's, you know, uh, things happening over next to the swampland, or you need to take the center where the grail is, you'll come one step closer to recovering and redeeming or bringing back King Arthur himself. Once you've done that three times, this board will flip. When this flips, you're actually going to get a second hero on the board. I don't have the model or the miniature for it. I'm sure it's gonna be lovely. They all are so far. And you now have two leaders. You have two heroes on the table, both of which are super powerful, both of which allow you to add extra combat cards when you're fighting in various regions, and they just start scattering and wreaking havoc across the game. You'll have King Arthur, and you'll have Guinevere. Now, you also have your faction abilities over here. Now, each faction is going to have asymmetry introduced when it comes to the settlements they're putting out. Remember, these little guys go down here, and as you uncover them, you're not only gonna be getting new deploy zones, you're also gonna be getting new places where you will naturally spawn, conquer, and score victory points as the game progresses through one, two, and three total rounds. But you'll also have your faction powers. Now, remember, on the other side of this board, it was just the standard actions. This is where it gets a little wild. Our faction power here with Guinevere and King Arthur is chivalry. Each of your champions is a legendary knight waiting to be revealed. Once per turn at any time, you may add an unused color banner to one of your champions to show which knight they are. Once a champion has a banner, it cannot be removed. They will remain that knight for the rest of the game and gain the ability depicted next to their name below. We have Sir Galliad, we have Sir Gay Gawain, we have Sir Percival, and we have Sir Lancelot, the Grail Knight, Kingdom Advance, uh, Slay the Beast, and Legendary Duel. These are each going to integrate with the game in unique ways, and deciding when and where you pull out their special powers is critical to how you play the game. Remember, you're going to be securing the land, you're going to be trying to accomplish missions, and pulling or summoning one of these guys out onto the table might just give you that slight tiny, this is a game that comes down to ones and twos, that slight tiny advantage that you need in order to finally get King Arthur out here onto the board. So, Sir Galliad, the Grail Knight, when he wins a battle where there is a relic, you're going to gain some victory points. Sir Gawain, the Kingdom Advance, you can move from his region if you have a settlement in the region, ignore the cost of the movement. Sir Percival, slay the beast. After an enemy bonds a mythic beast, deploy or move Percival and any two warriors to the same region. Go conquer, take over, and slaughter the creature they've just, well, bonded with. Which is kind of mean if you think of it in terms of like Clifford the Big Red Dog. But for the most part, these creatures aren't friendly. Well, I, I don't know why I, I picked up the treant right there. I'm like, these creatures are horrible. Horrible creatures that you should totally be afraid of. And then I, I pick up the guy that looks like uh, my favorite character from Lord of the Rings. All right, I'm kidding. Samwise Gamgee is my favorite character from Lord of the Rings. Don't judge me. I know BGG loves Golem. And, you know, Reddit is a big fan of Sauron. So everyone has their own taste and flavor. Sir Percival, Slay the Beast. Sir Lancelot, Legendary Duel. If Lancelot is, pres is present with an enemy hero, name an initiative one through three card. The owner must discard a card. Uh, or they are destroyed. This is big because cards are how you not only secure extra control of a region during the combat phase of the game, 
It's also the way that you take actions, play, and score victory points if you have any left over in your hand. So this is just a big debuff that you can summon. The experience of playing with our lovely Guinevere comes down to a game all about seeking and pursuing objectives. If you like a game that tells a story that gives you interesting moments to adapt to whatever's happened on the board, and you like the, the journey, you like conquering overwhelming, but you don't want to be focused too much on the area control side of the game as opposed to the bite-sized piece-by-piece, how do I min-max this one situation? That faction will work excellently for you. We have Mordred, more, 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 more dread, more dread, the undead. This is the, the ghoul, the, the opposite of King Arthur. This is the mage trying to summon up the undead hordes and renew his own embodied power. We're going to go ahead and flip his tile over so you can see how insane his board presence is. He has a ton of settlements that are going to be spreading across the board. He has a faction objective called Mortared the Ascendant. He's trying his best to, well, secure as much control and summon as many undead armies into this world as possible. And once he's, well, done that, once he's accomplished that task, he will flip over and he will become the ascended version of himself. More powerful, able to teleport around the board, able to acquire additional strength by consuming the souls and spirits of his own units. Super cool, super thematic and really works if you like one, a super, uh, you know, a super uh, brawly, very, very powerful character at endgame, or the alternative, if you like spreading and controlling everything with a lot of minor forces. That's what he's going to be great at. We can see his models here. We have his uh, leaders, his champions, we have his minions, and then we have his character here with the beautiful blue, by the way. Again, just absolutely absolutely stunning. I'm not so good at like showing it to a side camera yet. We'll figure it out. I don't want to mess with it too much. I know I can like open up the exposure a little bit, make things brighter. My desire to make this as fancy as possible is conflicting with my desire to get content out and onto the channel. We'll figure it out. We'll get there. He can spread undead hordes across the board. He can teleport if he's leveled up to pop into any combat region at the end of the round. So he's going to be able to hopefully kind of play a trump card. He does lose a little bit of power because he'll be consuming his foes when he does that, but or consuming his minions when he does that, but it's still a very powerful, very uh, do this one big thing because it matters type of move at the end of the game. And still other people could play strategic cards or move and shift units in accordance with that and they could still conquer and win the region. So it is still risky. We have his faction powers and abilities. We have corrupt the land, shambles, consume magical essence, unholy dominion, and raise undead hordes. Corrupt the land, after you resolve a card with a settlement on it, you're going to go ahead and, looks like draw two cards, shamble. Uh, you may move your people from a region with an altar of bones, which are going to be these things down here. So you're gonna be able to move around the board very effectively. Consume Magical Essence. After you win a bid for a Mythic Beast, do not bond it, but gain its VP. Then destroy the beast. Discard the beast card and Mordred gains a permanent plus one strength token. You want to eat creatures. Kind of terrifying, again, if you think of it in terms of Clifford the Red Big Red Dog, but if you look at how horrific these creatures are, I, I, don't, I, I grabbed a lovely golden stag. I guess for his sake... You know, Mordred would, would want to consume the thing that looks like the most regal version of a unicorn I've ever seen. But, uh, okay, I'll eventually I'll pull a beast that looks horrific and not just a creature that wants to be left alone and live on the land of Avalon and doesn't know why people are invading it with hordes of undead forces and, uh, you know, knights that are trying to claim honor and victory by slaughtering the mythical golden beast. Unholy Dominion, gain one victory point for every settlement you have in Avalon. Again, spread as much as possible. Exist Everywhere is kind of the name of the game. Raise Undead Horde, deploy one warrior to up to three revealed regions when you have where you have Altars of Bones. Altars of Bones are fun. So the way that you're going to play with him, if you enjoy, like I said, one big powerful head-to-head uh, -head skirmish style character that can just like soup himself up, or alternatively, if you enjoy spreading and the area control side of the game like this, he's going to be the faction that you want to play. We have the Fomorians, the Fomorians, Balor, 
the faction lord. I'm going to go ahead and flip this over so we can see his mission objective. And let's go ahead and show you how absolutely regal his models are. These guys are pretty sweet, and they come with an extra model, which is this tentacle beast creature. I mean, that's... You gotta, like... Someone has to admit, that is a good-looking sea creature. I'm not saying that I'm, like, uh, you know, attracted to him, but <laughs> if he was available, he should have given me a call before I got married. I'm a married man, and I will not be seduced by Balor, even though he has rippling abs and a tale that I could write home about to my dad. Let's go ahead and talk about how he works. You can summon a Leviathan, which is going to be his tentacle beast, right here lovely little uh i don't know snake type creature you don't even see the full thing it's massive it is going to be positioning itself on one of the seaboards in the north east west or south direction i don't know why i did it that way that was a terrible thing to do it upset me as well don't worry about it and they are going to be spreading power getting two extra strength at the regions directly in front of them with a total of four potential regions because you could stretch out here all the way to the middle. The way that you're going to be doing this is whenever you're able to uh, plus one each time you score first place in a coastal region. So secure regions uh, or place a settlement in a region once completed. Flip your lord before completion. You do not control the Leviathan. Leviathan is not out on the board before then. And you're going to be spreading settlements out here around the outer edge because you want the coast to be your ally. You're basically, for the record, a sunken ancient creature that doesn't really like being bothered and would like to see the depths of Avalon sink back into the murky, uh, you know, shallow grave that has existed for these creatures. Let me show you the type of creatures that these guys hate. These are fish guys. They hate birds. Again, I, I mean, this is just a, it is a glorious, regal, griffin-like uh, you know, looks a little bit like a phoenix with this long flowing tail. I don't know why Avalon has some of the most beautiful creatures that I've seen in any game that's supposed to have horrific, you know, terrifying creatures for you to fight, but I'm into it. I'm into it. They want to, they want to kill the bird. They want to, so if you like killing birds, there you go. This game style is going to function around one kind of programming, kind of uh, building towards some big major crescendo. It's also going to focus on how you score a large amount of points towards the end stage of the game. When you pull out your Leviathan, you really want to be able to in a, be, a, be in a position where you can secure all four regions that he's lending his strength to. And that could be a massive amount of victory points as the game progresses. So that's going to be the uh, focus here. All regions where your settlements are... Uh, present count as coastal regions to you as well as their usual type. So as you place settlements out, you're actually extending where your positioning allows. And you have this ability called tides, this uh, faction power that allows the water to raise and lower. You basically control the moon, I think. Tides start on high tide. At the end of each of your turns, move the tide marker to the next space. High, medium, low, then low, medium, high, and repeat. At each tide, you gain access to one passive and one active ability. Gain a max of one uh, action ability benefit per turn. So like I said, a little bit of programming, a little bit of clock management, a little bit of setting the game up, right? Get all the pieces, get all the dominoes stacked in a way that when you you know tilt that one, all of the bricks smack down and an entire house is built in one go. So from the deep, so the abilities you could choose here. Uh, before you resolve a card with any deploy action, plus one deploy. This can be used on any coastal region. Now, again, if you have a settlement out, any region could be a coastal region. Tsunami, choose a revealed coastal region. Destroy three enemy warriors in that region. You just get to wash them away. Don't play this game in South Carolina for at least another year or two. I, I think I'm allowed to make that joke. My sister was actually down there, and it was, I mean, one, terrifying, two, uh, thoughts and well wishes go out to everyone who was affected by the damage that those hurricanes caused. And three, our government really needs to, I don't want to get political here, and I don't care who you voted for, but our government needs to, to, to lend them more aid. It is shocking just how little resources, you know, a family uh, have down there. All right, we have Surge. Before you resolve a card... Gain the following reward based on its initiative. We have one, two, and three. 
So depending on the initiative that you have, you're going to gain an ability of summoning, of uh, putting out people, and of gaining some strength. It looks like when you explore, gain all the exploring uh, exploration token rewards instead of one. Now, these regions have a lot of rewards associated with them, some of them more than others, and this gives you all of that's It's very powerful. And uh, so like here, you want to be able to be exploring as much as possible when you're on that title flow, when you're there. And Savage, if you gain a card before the end of your turn, gain another card. Very nice. Cards, again, are victory points, our abilities, and our strength for battle. And Encroach, your settlements gain some card ability, and after resolving it, you gain victory points until you have, uh, uh, for any unit you have there. So you can get rid of cards in order to go ahead and gain uh, extra settlements out on the board or strength out on the board. I don't know what that symbol is right now. Let me find the symbol over here. I'll find it. One day I'll find it. I'm going to give up looking for it. I'm just going to continue with this video. Don't worry about that. Let's move on to the last faction that we have. We have Merlin. Merlin is our bring balance to the world archetypal mage that really doesn't like everything happening. He's the guy that actually wants to rescue and save these beautiful creatures that exist here throughout Avalon. Like creatures like this. Look look how I look look how beautiful this I mean you just want a uh you know pitchfork and and mallet wielding abomination or a horned uh what I would call jagged spike bear like that's like Merlin wants these creatures to have a good long life he wants a, a burbulous ghoul like witch to have a good long life that's what he's advocating for that's what he wants to happen his model is awesome I, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a, a warlock or a druid with one such an aggressively flowing cape little birds are flying out from underneath the cape but if you can I mean that is I didn't ever notice that before and I now have a much deeper appreciation for this character. I think his whole cape is actually made out of, of, of birds. I'm not sure if they're just stapled to it because they're actually dead or if they're alive and it's as if he's flying around. I'm gonna assume he I'm gonna I'm gonna assume they're stapled to it. That's gonna be my assumption. Uh, I'm gonna i I'm gonna stick with that. So his main objective is going to be bringing balance to the world as a whole. He is looking to uh, set up a sacred site to preserve Avalon. Complete once you place six ley lines. So these are going to be little route building or area management, other tokens that you're placing out on the board. Uh, he doesn't really have as many settlements. He has one big settlement and then ley lines or spheres of influence are going to be placed out. Kind of if you think of uh, like spreading a disease in, uh, in root, you know, if you're playing the uh, what, Woodland Alliance or the COVID. Not COVID, the Corvid conspiracy. Came out in 2020, though. I don't know. I think uh, Leader Games predicted that nonsense. We should look more into what their involvement might have been with the Wuhan lab in China. Let's move on. Ley lines. Druids have one settlement where which is empowered by ley lines. Ley lines, ley line markers next to the faction abilities can be placed in a non-ley line region at any time during a player's turn by first having a unit there and then spending a faction power. They do not take up a settlement slot. Uh, take the topmost marker first. Each ley line has power and is its own settlement bonus. Every two marker tokens will provide a faction ability. Ley lines stay permanently in the regions. If all regions have ley lines, you may pay to place a second one in one or more regions. So you're spreading, you're getting your hooks in the ground, you're I don't know, convincing sword-wielding bears and goblins that they should be fighting on your behalf, and they believe you. When you have six of those spread out, you will summon your mobile settlement. This is going to be a giant, beautiful beetle that rises up, kind of like the turtle that the Earth actually lives on. It's turtles all the way down. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about that later. That's a future video, different channel, a whole, whole big thing. You're going to have a giant beetle that you're roaming the board with. This beetle is going to be giving you settlement powers and abilities like normal and is going to be basically popping a squat on whatever region you would like to control. And most people should get out of your way. The, the nice thing about this is instead of one super powered character, you're actually, again, setting up the board to benefit you as much as possible. And then you get strong at the end. And it's all about positioning and securing and figuring out what's going to do the most damage to the opponents that you have and give you the most benefit as you play. 
you can awaken the Ancient One, you can move him around the board, and you can secure the regions that he exists in because he is very strong and he is going to be lending a lot of power and a lot of summoning abilities to the table. Okay, let's see here. Faction powers. Remember, as you set ley lines, you're going to be unlocking your faction powers. Travel the ways. When deploying your ley lines in revealed regions, count as settlement. Additionally, you may spend power to apply this effect to an unrevealed ley line for this turn. Uh, then we have Master of, of Mists. If Merlin has not explored this turn, he may move to any ley line region, even mist regions, which he then may explore. So it's going to give you a little bit more power to teleport around the board. Again, holding balance. You can move anywhere at any time to try to secure this ground. The Raven summons plus two minions in a region where Merlin or the Ancient One is. The Ancient One is our lovely settlement. He's just going to be right now walking around like a giant beetle. That's, I mean, because that's literally what it, uh, Vortex of Power, destroy any one warrior, your choice, in every ley line region adjacent to where your settlement is. So you just start smashing things. You just start ruining, ruining people. That is one, terrifying, two, very powerful, and three, probably a whole lot of fun. Probably a substantial amount of fun. So there you have it. I've shown off the miniatures. I've highlighted the asymmetric powers and abilities and what it feels like to play them. You really are dipping into that beautiful asymmetry that exists in some of these faction-based board games, games like Root, which I think I might do a comparison to before this Kickstarter is over. I also want to you know, match this up with things like Inish, uh, Blood Rage, some of our other favorite Cyclades, area control, you know, combat-focused, card-driven game genre-defining things, right? I want to give everyone as big of a sense as possible as to what this game is doing and where it might work for them and might not work for them. These asymmetric powers aren't essential to the game, but I do think they're going to enhance the most advanced players or the most strategic players with a beautiful storyline, for me, highly thematic. And on top of that, interesting ways to explore faction powers that give you a little bit of direction, but don't too tightly confine you to the experience of play. The one setback is going to be like in Root, if you're playing with a faction, you do probably have to follow their pathway or else you'll be at a disadvantage to other players who are doing their strategy well. You have right now uh, Guinevere, who's focused on accomplishing missions and seeking goals one step at a time. You have our lovely undead, I'm terrible at names, man, Mordred, who is focused on spreading and conquering the land, you know, getting as many troops out on the board as possible until he's super powerful. You have our Bator, who is going to be the uh, hordes rising up from the ocean. You're trying to secure and position yourself for a big endgame finish. It's a lot of planning and programming, a lot of time management and action management. And then you have Merlin here, who is going to be focused on bringing balance, has a little bit more flexibility on where he is, and as he unlocks his big faction power and ability, he's going to be able to really adapt quickly and be very powerful wherever he then needs to focus his attention. I think the easiest factions to play is going to be uh, Guinevere and Merlin. Merlin has a little bit more flexibility. Guinevere is really focused on step-by-step -step progress. I think the hardest faction to play is going to be Bator. You really do have to focus on that ebb and flow of the tides, which thematically fits, but can make it so that the cards you have and the actions that you're taking need to be done in a sequential order, so you need to be thinking ahead as you play and explore. And then I think right there in the middle is going to be the undead hordes. You could find that you're being bullied too much and you don't know how to come back from that, or you could just get super powerful super strong and secure the grounds as you know the undead hordes tend to do with that I have one final question if you've watched to this point we're going to be putting out a gameplay video and I would love to hear from you what you would like to see do you want to see another version of the classic standard version of this game the game that I think the majority of people in the world will actually be playing I don't think most people will dive into the asymmetry of this title until they have a core game group that has experienced it two, three, four, five times. And I don't think it's necessary to play asymmetric. I would be happy to teach this game to players who are just playing on the standard mode. And I like that it provides both options. If I want to focus more on a strategic, hand-driven, card-driven area control game, the asymmetry probably actually takes away. It denotes from that experience. But if I want to focus on a little bit more of a thematic, role-driven, character-driven game, then I want to flip these boards over and play that asymmetric puzzle. So the question is really, do I want to play a Blood Rage or a Root? 
right? Like that's the puzzle that we're looking at. Root's going to be more the asymmetric factions. Blood Rage is going to be more the standard card-driven, hand-driven experience of conquering the land and securing as many victory points per round as you're able, while Chaos still continues to descend. So do you want to see the standard version, the version of the game that most people will experience, or do you want to see asymmetric powers highlighted? Do you want to see another three-player game, which I think might be the most balanced when it comes to time and complexity? But Dice Tower already put out a three-player gameplay, so are you looking to see how this functions at two players, which I think excellently, or four players, which does get a little bit slower, because a lot of people have things to read through, but is a very, very strong contender, and the map is wide open. There's a lot to explore and a lot more action happening on the table. So, four, three, or two-player version of the game. And finally, do you want to see two seasons or three seasons? The full extended version of the game or the smaller version? I will make one important note here that because this is a prototype, I will have to make sure that everything that I have here facilitates all of those experiences. Like, I know for a fact that if I play asymmet asymmetric factions and I'm playing with Guinevere out here on the board, I will have to have a stand-in for the miniature that we don't have for King Arthur. So there are a few little nuanced elements that might limit my ability to create a video or make it so that I'm adding in uh, things that aren't actually the board game so that the board game can run and function effectively. I'll make sure to reach out to the team and uh, double check everything that you all are recommending and asking for. And finally, if we're doing a two player version of the game, what factions would you like to see go head to head? I would, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you're looking for and what you'd like to see. And we're going to do our very best to facilitate whatever is the most requested, most demanded version of a gameplay video. Whatever the case, though, whatever you do, thank you for watching. And remember to do the important thing. Have a good Thanksgiving. Be curious and grateful. The world is an incredible place. And there's a lot of things out there that we just get the thrill of experiencing. I mean, if you're watching this video, if you're considering backing, you're setting yourself up for a future of game nights and friends and family. You have a, a future that you're orienting yourself towards that is very good. And hopefully an existence that you currently live in that is equally as good. So, be curious, be grateful, and have a good holiday season. We'll see you next time. Bye.